afternoon and welcome to the REIT webinar on prevalence and predictors of child abuse. I asked my panelists just before we began that REIT, which focuses on children affected by HIV, may be interested in why are we looking at child abuse. The background is that we have evidence that children who are affected by HIV, particularly those living in homes which are where there is somebody who is living with HIV or who have lost one of their parents, are more susceptible to violence of many different forms and abuse. Also, children who have survived abuse and violence are at greater risk of contracting HIV. So there are very close linkages between these two areas. And we are really privileged this afternoon to have two incredibly great panelists to present to us. Our first panelist is Francesca Mink. Francesca is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford. Her doctorate is also from Oxford and it's in social interventions. A lot of her research is together with Lucy Kluver, whom we sure is well known to many of us. She is speaking today on the physical, emotional, and sexual abuse of children in South Africa, the prevalence, perpetrators, locations, and risk factors for child abuse victimization in a large community sample. And I'm going to uh, I'll go to Francesca at this time and hand over to her to begin her presentation. Please, before she begins, if you have questions, just type them into the question box as we go through. We will take both presentations and then we will have questions at the end. But you are welcome to put your questions into the question box as the presentation are being made. So welcome. Great. Now uh, thank to you very much for the. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to speak to all of you today. Um, and yes, as um, uh, Lynette has already mentioned, we are. Um, I'm going to be presenting about our research in South Africa. Next slide, please. Um, our research, is, as many of you probably know, is um, very collaborative. We work together with the South African government departments with South African NGOs, um, international NGOs, and with South African universities. And we have an advisory group um, of 14 AIDS-affected teenagers um, who help us um, inform the way we ask the questions, who talk to us about um, how the questionnaires need to be designed, and all of that. Uh, what's really important about our research is that it's really just used um, for policy making. So all of the government departments and NGOs tell us what are the things that they need to know in order to improve policies or to base policies on, and we um, investigate these issues. Next slide, please. The study that we carried out uh, was a national study of young carers. Um, we interviewed 3,516 children in two provinces in South Africa. The two provinces were the Western Cape and Pumalanga. And we followed up 97% of them a year later. Uh, on the right hand side, so you can see our questionnaire. Um, it was designed based on the recommendation of the teen advisory group and it was um, supposed to um, reflect a teen magazine um, and the children very much enjoyed going through it. Um, it was very, very child friendly. Um, for our sampling, so we um, 
we recruit well we, we looked at health districts and we chose two health districts that had um, HIV prevalence above 30 percent um, in each of the provinces and then within these health districts uh, we uh, randomly selected census enumeration areas and within these census enumeration areas we went from house to house and we said is there a child between 10 and 17 and we asked whether we could interview that child um, to measure abuse um, for, for the purpose of this presentation, we use the UNICEF measures for national level monitoring of um, orphans and vulnerable children. Um, and for sexual abuse, we used um, items from the Juvenile Victimization Questionnaire that is a measure devised by David Finkelhor um, in the University of New Hampshire. Next slide, please. Um, here, uh, again, just briefly, um, next slide, please, our study sites, so Mpumalanga and the Western Cape very opposite ends of, this, of South Africa. Um, just to give you a brief overview of our, bas uh, of our, of our um, sample, so we had about um, slightly more females, um, so 54% at follow-up, 56% um, at baseline. Uh, we had, um, s well, we had at baseline slightly more children from urban areas and um, uh, then slightly more, ch uh, slightly less children from urban areas, as these were the ones that we were harder to find. Uh, we had about the same amount um, from um, Pomalanga and the um, Western Cape, so 47% were from Pomalanga, and um, at baseline they were 13 and a half years old, and then at follow-up um, they were 14 and a half years old, so um, just about a year older than they were when we interviewed them for the first time. Right, so uh, let's talk about the prevalence of child abuse victimization. Um, we, um, we split it up slightly, so the, the questions were, um, have you ever been hit with an object, um, have you been hit so that it hurt or that you were injured? Um, and uh, what, we, um, re what we see here is basically a spread of children that have responded ever to these questions and children that have responded quite frequent. Um, victimization. So we can see that 56% have ever been hit with an object or ever been hit so that it hurt, whereas about 7.4% of children say that they're hit frequently um, and we have we, we um, generally go by monthly victimization so, because that's a, f a fairly frequent um, measure. So 16.6% experience monthly uh, victimization. So it's quite a, quite a high uh, percentage of children. Um, so it's quite, quite regular victimization for physical abuse. Next slide, please. Um, for emotional abuse, we can see a similar spread. So 35.5% um, say that they've ever um, experienced emotional abuse. These are things like telling the child that they're stupid, um, telling them that you're calling the ancestors to punish them, um, threatening to abandon them, um, or threatening to, um, to hurt somebody um, or an animal that they, that they really care about. Uh, and again, we can see that um, in the monthly and weekly category, so the children that experience very frequent um, victimization, we, we can still um, we see about 20% um, report that they're being, um, that they experience regular emotional abuse. Next slide, please. Um, then we also looked at um, prevalence of sexual harassment and forced exposure to pornography. Um, and so sexual harassment is the yellow bars, um, forced exposure to pornography is, are the blue bars. Uh, and we can see again here, um, also we can see quite a spread, so um, sexual harassment is not as common as physical and emotional abuse, but it's um, 8% experience it regularly. Um, and forced exposure to pornography is um, is very low, um, but I'm, I'm sure that um, with more exposure through mobile phone technology, um, these levels will rise. Next slide, please. We've also looked at contact sexual abuse, um, and the yellow bars here are um, being um, touched or having to touch somebody else's geni genitals, um, and um, rape is um, being forced to, to engage in, in sex. Um, and what we can see here is that 9% um, say that they've ever been inappropriately touched or had been made to touch somebody else's genitals. Um, and about 3% still experience monthly contact sexual abuse victimization. Um, and, and that's really interesting because in many, um, um, in many other um, countries, in um, high income countries, we can see that um, official um, statistics generally say that about 3% is lifetime exposure, which I'm sure is probably an underestimate, uh, a huge underestimation, but um, 
but so this is what many children experience on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, for rape, we can see 3.3 Sorry, <laughs> go back, please. Uh, for rape, we can see 3.3% experience have experienced rape in their lifetime, so that's um, quite high as well. And what we can see also is that of all the children that are reporting sexual abuse victimization, 67% of them are female. So it's a majority of, of female children experiencing or reporting sexual abuse victimization. Next slide, please. We've also looked at multiple abuse victimization. Um, and um, again, this is um, spread out um, of in frequency of victimization um, and um, and color coded by the combinations of abuse that these children experience. So we can see 27.1% experienced physical and emotional abuse. So these two types of victimization frequently co-occur. Um, and um, the yellow bars again, so it's the highest um, physical and emotional abuse um, generally are uh, a fairly, at a fairly high level, whereas we can see um, emotional and sexual abuse, um, physical and sexual abuse, and physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, all three of them together um, co-occur um, less often, but they do co-occur, and um, so we, we, have, uh, we do have a number of children who are um, victimized multiple times with different types of abuse. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so we've also looked at the perpetrators, and um, what we've just seen, if, if you could go to the next slide, if we, what we've just seen is that um, physical and emotional abuse are very, uh, are often co-occur, and part of this is explained by who the perpetrators are. So we can see for physical abuse victimization, the vast majority of perpetrators are caregivers, 63%. Um, and we can also see that um, despite um, corporal punishment being unlawful in schools, we can, or um, abolished in schools in South Africa, we can see that 24.5% um, of the children who report um, physical abuse have actually been hit by teachers. So um, uh, quite interesting findings here, but um, nothing, nothing new, um, I think, just corroborates what other evidence is already suggesting. And if we move to the next slide, we can see a very similar picture. So again, um, caregivers are the main perpetrators of emotional abuse. Um, and um, obviously that makes sense because they are the people that uh, children spend most time with um, and wh whose care they are in. And then we can see that um, teachers don't play as much of a role, but relatives play uh, a little bit, uh, are, are um, the second most common perpetrator um, of emotional abuse. Next slide, please. We can see a very different picture for perpetrators of contact sexual abuse. Um, so what we can see here is that 22.8% um, GF and BF is girlfriend and boyfriend. So um, the majority of children, ex of, of the children in this sample, experience contact sexual abuse either by an intimate partner or by their peers, where they say other kids, 26.5%. So the largest group of uh, perpetrators are actually peers; they're not strangers, as um, many um, wrongly assume. And then we can see some victimizations through relatives and neighbors. Um, a little bit through teachers and a little bit through caregivers, but, most, but mostly, really mostly, um, um, intimate partners and other peers. If we go to the next slide, we can see the perpetrator's rape. And again, there is a similar picture. Um, we can see the highest um, or the, the largest number um, of rapes reported now. Our sample were perpetrated by strangers with almost 30%. Um, but um, other children and um, um, intimate partners, particularly intimate partners um, and relatives, are, um, are, are also um, very high um, on the list of perpetrators. So, um, yeah, so we can see basically slightly different structures, physical and emotional abuse mostly ca uh, perpetrated by caregivers, um, sexual abuse mostly perpetrated by um, intimate partners and peers. Okay, next slide, please. So we also looked at where children being victimized, um, and um, this is um, again. So um, for light blue, we see physical abuse. Um, purple is emotional abuse. Uh, red is contact sexual abuse, and uh, sorry, yellow is contact sexual abuse, and red is rape. So we can see that um, the home and the school are actually the places where most children are being victimized. So if, particularly for physical and emotional abuse, we see um, a large occurrence in the home, and then for physical abuse, large occurrence within the in the school. Um, and for um, sexual abuse, sorry, sexual abuse and rape, um, we can see um, 
particularly high occurrence within the school and then sexual abuse also happening within the community. So th these are places where we need to protect our children most. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Right, so we've also looked at risk factors for physical and emotional abuse victimization. And um, one, of the, um, one of the things that has been coming out of research is that there's, there's been uh, a lot of an indication that children in families affected by um, illness are at higher risk for abuse victimization. Um, and uh, so we um, compared children from families uh, where somebody was ill with AIDS um, and families from children where um, everybody was healthy and families from children where um, somebody was um, ill with another chronic illness such as diabetes or high blood pressure. And what we can see here is um, the not ill are the yellow group, the other ill are the blue group and the AIDS ill are the families in AIDS, the, the children in AIDS still families are the red group. And we can see persistently higher levels of um, physical and emotional abuse in AIDS ill families compared to other illness and um, healthy families. And we see no differences for sexual abuse and that, um, that also um, corresponds to, to evidence from other studies. Can we move to the next slide? So we hypothes hypothesized therefore that um, AIDS illness or other chronic illness um, may um, predict abuse victimization um, and so we've used longitudinal data for this and that just means that we measured AIDS illness, at, um, family AIDS illness at baseline um, and then looked at whether there was a higher risk for physical or emotional abuse at follow-up and this is, I'm just showing you the picture here for physical abuse but it's the same for emotional abuse um, so what we can see here is that AIDS illness directly affects the risk for physical abuse victimization so if you're from a family that, um, where somebody is AIDS ill you're more likely to experience physical abuse but um, the relationship also operates via two mediators and what we can see here is poverty so if you're um, AIDS ill you're more likely to be poor and if you're more likely to be poor you're more likely to experience abuse um, and if um, you're in your family there's somebody ill with AIDS, um, they're more likely to be more disabled or have higher levels of disability and higher levels of disability also increase the risk for abuse. So we can see that it's, it's not just AIDS illness, it's all of the um, corresponding things that go in line with AIDS illness that increase the risk for child abuse victimization. Can I have the next slide please? We've also looked at um, other chronic illness in this model and so what we can see here is actually interestingly we see that other illness or the other family illness reduces the risk for um, physical abuse victimization but also for emotional abuse victimization. So we have a direct relationship if you're in a family where there's somebody ill with another illness or another chronic illness other than AIDS, you're less likely to experience physical abuse victimization. If you live in a family where somebody has um, another chronic illness, you're also less likely to experience poverty, um, which we can see by the little link up. But what we can also see is that if you are more, if you are uh, experience higher levels of poverty, your link to um, abuse victimization or your risk for abuse victimization is still higher than in families where there's lower risk for poverty. Um, and we can also see a moderate uh, mediation through disability where we can see that if you experience another type of illness, another type of chronic illness in your family, um, the levels for disability are again higher and then higher levels of disability increase the risk for physical abuse victimization. But it's the same for emotional abuse victimization. So basically children in eight cell families are at higher risk of um, frequent physical and emotional abuse because they're high levels of poverty um, and because there are higher levels of disability but also just because there's a direct link between AIDS illness and um, abuse victimization whereas um, for families with other illness the direct link is basically they are at reduced risk of physical abuse victimization um, and have lower risk for poverty but they have a higher risk for disability and where there's, a, where there's high poverty and high disability they are at higher risk of physical and emotional abuse victimization. Next slide, please. We've also looked at sexual abuse victimization, and particularly in girls, because the majority of children reporting sexual abuse victimization were female. And we um, investigated several um, risk factors. Um, and these risk factors were previous assault, so children who'd been girls who'd been previously um, assaulted in the community. This is not sexual um, assault, it's any type of assault with a weapon or with a hand. Um, 
The, um, then we investigated school dropout and we investigated previous sexual abuse victimization. And as you can see, when, you're, when you are um, in the no risk factor category, so you haven't experienced assault, you have not experienced school dropout or you're not dropped out of school and you have not ha experienced previous sexual abuse, your risk of, engage, of, of, having, um, of experiencing um, contact sexual abuse victimization is about 5%. But if you have experienced previous assault, you have experienced previous sexual abuse victimization, and you have dropped out of school, your risk of experiencing sexual abuse is over 40%. So it's quite a high increase um, in risk um, over the three different risk factors. Um, and and so we, we when we make when we make programs to prevent um, sexual abuse victimization, we need to very carefully take into account the different types of risk factors that put children into um, at risk of sexual abuse. Next slide, please. We've also looked at um, protective factors, and uh, so we've looked at peer support um, in relation to contact sexual abuse in the sample, and we found something very interestingly. So this graph is um, it's, it looks quite complicated, but actually it is quite easy. So on the side here, on the left hand side, where it says the probability of contact sexual abuse, um, it basically means your risk in a thousand. So if we look at where the two lines cross, um, where it says no assault on the left hand side. Um, it means that um, <clears throat> that your risk um, of being uh, of of experiencing sexual abuse is about one in a thousand, one point three in a thousand, um, or actually less. It's about one in a thousand because it's um, under the 0013. Um This is for children who experience low and high peer support but have not experienced assault. So children who have um, not experience previous assault and experience any type of peer support, whether low or high, um, or none, they, are in the, uh, they have a risk of one in a thousand to experience sexual abuse victimization. But if we move to the right-hand side where it says assault, you can see the high peer support group, their risk actually reduces. So if you have, um, have experienced assault um, and you are in the high peer support group, your risk of um, experiencing sexual abuse victimization is actually lower than one in a thousand. But if you are in the low peer support group, your risk of experiencing sexual abuse is 2.5 in a thousand. So um, it's basically almost tripled your risk of um, abuse victimization, but it is also lowered your risk of it. So high peer support lowers your risk of sexual abuse victimization um, and um, High peer, um, low peer support increases your risk for sexual abuse victimization. Next slide, please. We've also looked at access to services for abused children. Um, and what we found here, next slide, please, um, is that virtually out of 3,401 children, virtually everybody knew where to find appropriate services. So 89.4% knew that they could contact the police or a social worker that they could contact um, a teacher or um, or childline or um, or the street committee. So they all knew where they could go. Of children that had experienced at least one incident of abuse, we had 2,262 children that had experienced at least one incident of abuse. Only 150 requested any help following the abuse. And of the 150 requesting any um, help following the abuse, only 108 received help. Um, of the 108 who received help, 53 received community vigilante. So these were things where they went to the street committee and the street committee beat up the perpetrator or killed the perpetrator or chased the perpetrator away. So they, these were not um, official services. Um, um, <coughs> provided by by the community. 16 received medical or social services, 21 received help from the police, and 18 received other help, which is um, they talked to a teacher, and the teacher um, gave them a hug and consoled them, or something like that. Um, in 37 cases out of the 150, there was no action taken, and five children were re-victimized. And if we just look at the drop-off from the knowledge about abuse services, and the actual amount of uptake and the actual amount of um, children who got help, 
or the, the actual percentage of children who got help, we can see that there's a stark difference. Um, and we really need to be, when we're making interventions, we need to really be addressing why the question, why are these children not um, accessing services? Um, and why is the majority of children who are accessing services actually re um, receiving community vigilante action and not any of the um, other services, the official services that are offered? Next slide, please. And that brings me um, to the end of my presentation. So in conclusion, we can see high rates of physical and emotional abuse. Um, we see lower rates of sexual abuse of uh, victimization, but that may be possibly influenced by age because we had a very young cohort of children um, and the, um, the majority of sexual abuse victimization in the other, in the VAX studies that um, Nankali will be presenting about um, was around the age of 16 to 17. Um, we see that physical and emotional abuse is largely perpetrated by caregivers and sexual abuse largely perpetrated by peers and that large numbers of children get victimized at school and in their home. Um, we can see that children in AIDS-affected families have a higher risk for um, physical and emotional abuse and that is partially due to higher levels of poverty but also higher levels of disability and um, that children in families affected by other chronic illnesses have a lower risk for abuse. Um, but if they experience high levels of poverty and high levels of disability, they also have a higher risk for physical abuse and emotional abuse victimization. And we can also see that school dropout and previous victimization make girls more vulnerable to sexual abuse and that we have very low levels of service access um, and that we need to be um, addressing these. Thank you very much. I think the next slide just shows our funders, whom we are very grateful for. And then with that, I would like to give back to Lynette and my co-presentation. Francesca, thank you very much. I'm sure we do have questions. As we said, we will take questions at the end. Right now, I would like to go straight to our second presentation, which is from Nankali Maksud. Uh, Nankali is well known to the READ membership. She was previously with UNICEF SRO. She is now the Chief of Protection with UNICEF in Malawi, and she will be speaking about the results of the Violence Against Children survey that UNICEF has conducted in Malawi. Over to you, Nankali, and welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Lynette, um, and, and thanks to all for the opportunity to be able to share the results of um, the Violence Against Children survey in Malawi. Um, I'm doing this presentation on behalf of the Ministry of Gender, Disability, Children and Social Welfare. Um, the directors would have, had, would have liked to have an opportunity to do this presentation, but unfortunately um, we're not available at this time. Um, this survey is, is the first national representative data on the prevalence of violence against children in Malawi. Um, next slide, please. The, the key finding from, from the survey is that two out of three um, Malawian experience violence in childhood. Um, I just want to highlight that that shows that this violence against children is clearly a major concern in, in Malawi and um, two out of three experiencing violence in childhood shows that this is a pervasive and common occurrence in all settings in Malawi. Um, the presentation of, of the outline is, is, is that I'll start off with the background, the objectives of the survey, key findings, the different forms of sexual of, of violence, um, service seeking behavior, the consequences of violence, and then the next steps. Next slide, please. Now, the, the background to, to the survey is, is that this was a survey conducted through the government of Malawi. It was funded by DFID and conducted in 2013, and the results were finalized in late 2014, and then subsequently launched in 2015. Um, UNICEF, the Center for Disease Control, and the Center for Social Research in Malawi provide technical expertise. The survey was defined to provide national representative figures, and, and based on that, it, it was carried out in all the districts of Malawi, all 28 of them. Um, it has a qualitative and quantitative component, 
and um, questionnaires were issued to, to both males and females. 2,162 interviews were completed um, with, with both, as I said, fem males and females. Um, 18 to 24 year olds were interviewed and for them the intent was to provide their lifetime prevalence of violence during childhood and then 13 to 17 year olds in order to provide the incidence of violence in, in the past year. All the data was um, disaggregated by gender. Next slide please. Now the objectives of, of the survey was you know, first of all to describe the magnitude and nature of the problem. I think Malawi like most countries in, in the region didn't uh, have a sense of, we talked about violence um, in an emotive manner, but we didn't know the magnitude or the nature of the problem. We also wanted to assess the health consequences. We wanted to identify potential risk and protective factors, and then to assess utilization of services. Um, and then finally, of course, help guide prevention programs and policies for the country. Now, the, in the next slide, you'll see the key findings, um, and, and as I've already stated, it shows that violence against children in Malawi is, is extremely widespread. Um, our highlight findings are that you know, two out of three Malawians experience violence in childhood, one out of five girls are sexually abused before the age of, 15, of 18, and two out of three boys suffer physical violence before the age of 18. And that violence, I think, similar to the last presentation, just occurs in all settings, in the home, in the school, and in the community at large. So moving on to the specific type, types of, of violence, um, as I said, one in five girls experience sexual abuse before um, they turn 18. Now, sexual violence, a definition um, for us within the Malawian context, and, and this is similar to the other VAC surveys that have taken place um, globally, is, 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 is um, it encompasses unwanted sexual touching, unwanted attempted sex, physically forced sex, pressured sex, and, and sexual exploitation. Now, the most frequent perpetrator of sexual violence within Malawi for 18 to 24-year-olds were, were a romantic partner similar to the previous presentation, and for 13 to 17 year olds it was a classmate followed by a romantic partner. So clearly the, the theme around the intimate partner is, is, is maintained. Now while we have highlighted um, the prevalence rate amongst girls, we do also want to share that one in seven males also experience sexual violence. So yes, um, there's a greater issue amongst um, young girls but we should not forget young men as well while we are designing the different response programs out there. For 18 to 24 year old boys, the most frequent perpetrator of sexual violence was a friend followed by a neighbor. Next slide, please. Now, um, as, as this presentation is being done for the RIAT, um, we've included slides in, in this presentation to show um, the results of the survey in other countries in the region and also other parts of the world, such as Haiti and Cambodia, where um, a similar survey has also been, been has also taken place. Um, the message, I think, similar to the first presentation, is that in terms of, of sexual violence, for sure, you know, young girls are, are a major target. Um, we see Swaziland coming up very high, followed by Zimbabwe, Kenya, Tanzania, etc. While Malawi is, is fairly low compared to the other countries in the region, I, I think what's important for us to focus on is not, is not so much that, oh, well, the problem is not so bad here, but that we do have a problem, especially with young girls, and that needs to be addressed, like in most of other parts um, of the region. For the RIA, it's important, I guess, to look at it as, as a regional perspective, that young adolescent girls are, are suffering from sexual abuse. Next slide, please. In terms of physical violence, um, we're highlighting boys particularly because of, it seems to be a, a, a concern mostly for them. Two out of three boys in Malawi experience physical violence um, at childhood. Now the next slide shows that physical violence um, for us was defined as being punched, kicked, whipped, um, beaten with an object, choked, smothered, tried to drown, burned or scalded intentionally. Now. Um, it's also an issue for, for females. Um, two out of five females also experience physical violence. 
And when you look at the perpetrators, um, adult relatives, peers, community members, almost always teachers, I think that, that's important to, to highlight, especially as we try to push as many children into schools as possible, are the frequent perpetrators of physical violence um, against children. Again, if you look at it from, from, from a regional perspective, um, in, in Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, boys um, more, more than girls suffer from physical violence, but th there isn't really that, that big gaps. I think there's a general problem of physical violence in the region that, that needs to be addressed. But clearly, if we design this through the lens of young boys, um, we might be able to, to make greater impact immediately. The next slide is on emotional violence. Um, here we're looking at um, one, one in five girls and one in three boys experience emotional violence before the age of 18 within Malawi. Now emotional violence um, refers to inappropriate verbal behavior. I think it's, it's, it's probably what Francesca also was trying to describe within, within hers. It's, it's comments like, I don't love you, I don't care about you, etc. towards young children, which has a damaging impact on their mental health and development. So within Malawi, 8 out of 10 children experience emotional violence um, and, and suffer from a pattern of violence. And it's not just you know, once, once in their life, but it's multiple instances within their life. Before we go to the next slide, I just want to highlight that it's the, the, the multiplicity of the abuse or violence um, for all these children, is, it, it happens over and over in, in their lives as childhood, regardless of the type of violence. So whether it's sexual violence, physical violence, or emotional violence, for any child who's experienced any of these forms of violence, it happens multiple times before they turn into um, adults. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of um, service-seeking behaviors, and, and here I just want to highlight that this particular slide is, is around sexual abuse, but a similar story can be highlighted also on physical um, abuse. When we look at the bottom of this triangle, um, you know, 59, almost 60 percent of girls told somebody about their sexual abuse, while 54 percent of boys told somebody. But as you go up um, the triangle, what, what, what's really worrying, of course, is that um, only about 8% or 5% of girls and boys actually seek any services. And from those who seek any services, 3% or 1% of them actually receive any services. So while a lot of the focus of programs around child protection are on service provision, a lot of the time um, the children are not receiving their services. Um, while they're, they're comfortable, able, at least some, almost half of them are able to tell somebody about it, but they don't actually get any, any response back. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the consequences of violence, um, the, the consequences of, 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 for children suffering violence, of course, are severe. Children who experience violence, you know, are shown to suffer higher rates of mental distress, greater prevalence of smoking and alcohol abuse more frequent um, procurement of STIs, and higher rates of self-harming behaviors. This is some of the studies that you know, have been done elsewhere in the world and some of the work that WHO has been highlighting um, to us. In addition, I'd also like to, to look at the economic consequences of, of violence. Uh, a recent study by the Copenhagen Consensus showed that the cost of violence against children is at about 4.3% of global GDP or some 3.7 trillion um, US dollars. So yes, it's important for us to respond, it's important for us to provide services to alleviate the impact of violence, but clearly most of our focus or um, a great part of our focus needs to be around prevention, which it hasn't been um, so far. Next slide, please. Now, um, in the context of Malawi, um, we have the study now. We are now looking at developing an, an, a response plan. We have a draft in place. So we'd like to implement a national prevention focus, multi-sexual response plan within the context of the National Plan of Action for Children that, that's, that's currently being finalized. We're looking at resource mobilization for the different um, priority areas that will be defined. We'd also be modeling a, a multi-sexual child protection system going down from district level. And finally, we'll be implementing a national campaign, um, this time evidence-informed on prevention of violence against both women and children. 
those are just highlights of some of the next steps that we'll, we'll be developing, but clearly we'll have a national plan of action which will identify more areas um, of response. Next slide, please. Um, so thank you very much. Um, as Lynette has said, my name is Nankali. You, you can see my email there and a colleague of mine, Martin, as well. And soft copies of the survey can also be accessed at, at the, the, in the website that's being highlighted over there. Thank you very much. And back to you, Lynette. Thank you so much to both Nankali and Francesca. I think both surveys have clearly shown just the magnitude of this problem in two different countries, but Nankali has also given us comparative data from other countries in our region. It's obvious that too many children in this region, both boys and girls, are experiencing violence and abuse. At the moment, we do not have any questions from our audience. So I would like to ask you both to comment on something that I found really disturbing, which is the low level of service provision and what we need to be doing about this. Because it's one thing that children are experiencing violence. It's another that we're not able to support them when they have experienced it. Uh, yes, thank you, Lynette, for this question. Um, I think uh, there are multiple issues. So from our qualitative research, uh, what mostly came out is that children, um, th there is a negative attitude towards disclosure um, in within um, the populations that we did the research. I mean, probably m many other populations as well. But within this population group, it was very clear. Many children reported that when they disclosed to somebody in their family, uh, particularly their mother, um, particularly sexual abuse, that they were hit or beat, uh, were beaten up or told that they were lying. Um, Children were not generally supported in disclosing to services, so there, um, there, there is an, a less supportive, well, there is a, a non-supportive attitude within the home that does not um, support children in accessing these services. I think then there's um, an additional problem that when um, what we found a lot in South Africa is that when children do go to, particularly for sexual abuse, go to um, the, their local clinic. Um, to receive services, um, or particularly for an HIV test or um, post-exposure prophylaxis, that they're being told they can't get the service unless they make a statement to the police. Um, and um, and so these children basically, and then they're being interviewed by policemen who are not um, particularly trained in child protection and who um, insinuate that uh, it is their fault and that they really wanted it um, and that, um, you know, uh, and so they're being re-victimized again. Um, so I, th and, and these, um, these experiences um, do spread within the community. So when children say, yes, we can go to the police and you say, well, do you know what happens at the police? Um, they're very aware that um, somebody at the police station will probably know the perpetrator um, will talk to the perpetrator about them having made a statement um, and that um, their whole village will know what has happened to them by the time they leave the police station um, and they are very scared of re-victimization. Um, so it's a, it's a whole magnitude of factors, I think, that impact on whether children access services or not and it's I think part of it is the training of the um, officials and service uh, providers involved. Part of it is um, the attitude in the home, um, and part of it is um, the um, um, the availability of services that is conditional of you disclosing to somebody else, like the police, making a, opening a case at the police station rather than being able to just to be served. With, for the health issues that you may be having or that you may want to avoid. 
Princess Kanankali, before I ask you to comment, there is also a specific question about why there is a discrepancy between the proportions who seek help for sexual abuse and those who receive any help in Malawi specifically. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Lynette. Um, I, yes, the, the, the slide that is being referred to is, is, is at the core of, of what we need to do to be able to go forward. Um, I think it's been interesting to find out the prevalence rate. So we know two out of three children experience some form of violence, and the issue is what, what we're going to do about it now. Now, linked to the survey, we've also analyzed administrative data, looking at the data from police stations, looking at one-stop centers, the kind of tutuzelas that you have in South Africa, and, and looked at um, if you do have two out of three um, experiencing violence, how many of those are actually going to our service points? Um, we do know that our investment so far has been heavily in providing services. So, but when we look at the data from the administrative data from service points such as the police and the one-stop center, it's very low. So it's similar to what Francesca is saying that we can see from the triangle that both young girls and young boys, over 50% actually tell somebody when they experience sexual abuse, but then very few of them actually seek services. And so for us going forward, we're trying to find out what is it that's going on there. And, and maybe it's, it's some of the things that Francesca has been referring to in terms of um, the social norms around it, the, the embarrassment, the, the, the hiding culture. Um, but for us, so what, what we're going to do now is we want to find out who it is that they tell, and we already have information that a lot of them tell fellow young people and so a target of our response going forward is to look at schools and the information um, amongst young people. So if, they're, if they're talking to each other, what information are they sharing um, with each other? Within the Malawi context, we can't even reach a point where we start talking about the services not being responsive because we don't, the numbers are not even, the numbers are so low in terms of those who come to services that, that it's, it's not even a call, they're just not coming even to test it and see whether it's, it's child friendly or responsive, etc. So when abuse or violence does take place, it's staying in the household. And so we want to see how can we reach out into the household and be able to assist these young girls and boys to be able to come out, to report, to seek services, and to get some kind of response. Thank you. Um, and while we're on the issue of schools, there is a question about are we aware of any programs that are effective in schools and that are doing good work in terms of educating young people about services which are available? Well, I mean, f from our data, it suggests that they all know where to get services. So they they were all able to name, 98% of them were able to name the police or, you know, their, their rape center, their local rape center or um, child line or, you know, an, an, appropriate pers or an appropriate service to disclose to um, and to seek services from. Um, so the, the knowledge about the services um, as such doesn't seem to be the issue. The issue seems to be translating from the knowledge, yes, I can go to the, pol well, the, the police are there to help me, to can I actually go to the police when this has happened to me? Um, and, um, and I'm not aware of any, um, of any um, education programs in schools that are um, enabling children to, to take this last step. Um, I'm also not aware of any programs um, that involve parents or the community that um, enable um, children to access services more easily or to, uh, to, um, that, that allow a, a discussion about um, physical, emotional and sexual victimization and how to respond to it. Um, what we are currently testing, um, but this is just one approach of many, so we are currently testing a parenting intervention for parents um, of, of t or caregivers of teenagers and the teenagers together in uh, the Eastern Cape. And part of this intervention is also um, how to respond to when bad things happen in the family, um, how to react to the what we, kind of solution-based, um, how do we resolve um, these issues, where can we get help, um, and so forth. But um, 
but this is just one of many and we're just currently in the process of trialing it so we will see uh, we'll have data on that in in May uh, but um, yeah but I don't know of any interventions that specifically target um, this issue Nankali, there's a question about whether we're aware why Swaziland is so much higher than the other countries. So if you would like to comment about the schools and also ask that question, answer that question. Sorry, sorry Lynette, could you repeat the first part? The question was higher? why the prevalence in Swaziland was the highest of all countries. You had a slide there with prevalence of abuse and in, uh, violence against children, and Swaziland had the highest figures. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Lynette, I cannot respond to why Swaziland has um, the highest rate of, of violence, but it's certainly something that we can be able to find out. And maybe through the REACT mechanism, I mean, I can certainly feed that back and, and we can possibly post it on the REACT website um, at, at another time, but it's something that can be followed up on. Um, in terms of programs in schools that address issues of violence, I think there's a number of programs that are taking place um, within the region and, and PLAN has certainly um, come out as, as one of the lead um, civil society partners that are, that are looking at how to empower young people in schools to be able to identify situations of violence violence and, and respond to, um, to them when they become um, survivors of different forms of, of violence. I'm just naming that off the top of my head. The challenge, of course, is that um, the programs that, are, that have been designed are not um, linked to, to national curriculums, so they don't become a part of the national education sector um, responses. Um, so they tend to have short lifespans and, and they don't go on over, over time. So one of the things we're trying to look at, and uh, certainly from a regional perspective, is how we can engage the education sector to, to embrace issues of vulnerability in children, be it through HIV, poverty, or violence, um, to integrate that into, into their, their curriculums. Um, thank you, Lynette. Back to you. Thank you, Francesca. There are a couple of questions for you around the differences between AIDS illness and other illnesses and the relationship between that and poverty and abuse. I think we've sent you those questions. I have not received any questions. Ah, okay, then let me read it to you. Um, Thank you. The difference between AIDS illness and other illness vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to poverty and abuse. In particular, what direction is the relationship? Is a household with AIDS illness more likely to be impoverished or are impoverished people more likely to have AIDS illness? Could we hypothesize on why the impacts of AIDS vis-a-vis -vis other illnesses are so dramatically opposite when it comes to poverty and abuse? Yes, great. Okay, um, I'll start off with the first question. Um, the difference between AIDS illness and other illness, uh, I, I assume this is a... Um, uh, this is just to clarify what, what we considered AIDS, as AIDS illness and what we considered as other illness. Um, so children filled in the verbal autopsy tool, um, which has a number of um, symptoms um, of AIDS-defining illnesses and um, a number of um, common illnesses um, that, well, illnesses that are common in South Africa. Um, and we have, uh, and we then calculated um, with um, based on the number of AIDS-defining um, symptoms that they were having, um, uh, three plus um, was used as a baseline. So um, where they ticked that somebody in their household had three plus AIDS-defining illnesses, we would classify that household as um, having somebody in it uh, with AIDS. Um, other illnesses was um, things like uh, diabetes, um, asthma, um, high blood pressure um, and um, 
and other types of disability um, such as um, you know um, not being able to see or um, and so forth uh, so basically chronic illnesses um, the relationships the temporality is, is, a, is a really excellent question actually um, so we um, we uh, used um, illness status at baseline um, and um, child abuse um, at follow-up, so at time two when we collected the data. And we looked at poverty as a um, mediator, which was um, statistically, it's basically in between. So we, um, uh, we calculated a mean score of poverty um, at both baseline and follow-up, added them together and then divided them by two. Um, so, um, it, so that it has a temporal element to it still. Um, but uh, the point that the um, the person who makes the qu uh, who asked the question makes is is very excellent. That yes, um, there is obviously a circular relationship. So that families affected um, by poverty or families who are living um, uh, in with high levels of poverty are more likely to be affected by AIDS, um, and um, families who are affected by AIDS are more likely to be living in poverty. So um, so that there's certainly a, um, a circular relationship there. Um, the um, differences in relationship between AIDS illness, poverty, and um, abuse, um, I think, are particularly down to that we have different types of population groups um, who are um, ill within the households. So the households with AIDS illness um, had a much younger mean age than the households with other chronic illnesses. And so we think that... Um, the relationship between poverty, between chronic illness and poverty, is very heavily influenced by the by the amount of grants um, people get. So, um, fam uh, families with other chronic illness were much more likely to get a pension grant within their household than families um, who were ill with whether somebody was ill with AIDS. Um, and the pension grant is um, considerably larger than um, the child grant, for example, or any of the other grants um, um, that um, uh, that um, f families get within the regions. And so, um, part of the relationship of less lesser poverty in families affected by other chronic illness may be due to the fact that these people are older and therefore get a, a pension grant. Does that answer the question? Um, I've got a couple of questions for Nankali. First of all, around the causality. Do we have any data from the VAC study in Malawi that would link HIV with violence or any of the other factors that may be driving violence? For instance, isolation, discrimination, urban or rural contexts? That's the one question. The other one is, would you please comment uh, some more on prevention of violence and what we could be doing because we tend to put more of our money into responding even though we don't seem to be responding very effectively. All right. Thank you very much, Lynette. Um, on, on your first question on causality, um, or let's say the drivers of violence, that, that is the part of our next um, research agenda going forward. The, the VAC survey for now was just for us to find out you know, the prevalence rate, how much violence, what type of violence is taking place against children in Malawi at the moment. Um, we have that now, so going forward, we're going to start looking at, at the drivers, you know, what, what's, what's creating this, why, why do we have these behavior patterns, and more importantly, of course, is how we can, how we can be able to stop them. So we can, we can guess um, intelligently about different things. Um, we can also look at other studies, such as the one that Francesca has done in South, South, in South Africa, and, and look at whether there are similarities from, it, from Malawi right now, but there is no research currently in Malawi looking at um, the drivers of violence. In terms of prevention, um, yes, this and, and, and um, as, as you were sharing with, with, with the listeners at, um, at the beginning of the we, we had that discussion at the beginning and 
um, Francesca was talking about the importance of, of having services, and, and yes, I agree, but that seems to be a, a favorite place for us to, to put our investments, to put our money, and to put you know, our efforts behind. We need to stop the violence from taking place in, at all. That, that, that really should be a great part of, of what it is that we're doing to, in terms of protecting um, children and, and especially young girls. Um, Lynette, there is a challenge in terms of, of, of preventing violence in terms of knowing what it is that we need to do. Um, I think that another reason of why we're investing so much in terms of services is that there's a, there's a natural intuition that we should invest in the child helpline, we should invest in the police, in the judiciary, etc. But we don't know what to do to prevent violence from taking place. Um, from Malawi, um, one of the things that we're going to do now is, is, is what we started off is, is a Norwegian funded project which is looking, is focused around the schools, is, is looking at how we can empower um, young people so they don't find themselves in situations that, lead, that make them vulnerable to violence. But then as we've had from Francesca's presentation, there might be something which are out of the control of young people. They might be coming from a house, a, you know, a poor household or a household that has been impacted by HIV or any other long-standing illness. We're trying to look further into this to understand what it is that we can do to be able to prevent mm -hmm. violence. We've selected the schools and reaching out to young people as, as our first point where we think we can be able to get some, some perhaps quicker learning. But we know there are many other areas. Um, as I shared, um, the violence study in Malawi was not just quantitative, it also had qualitative components. So we know that there are also negative cultural behaviors that are making children more vulnerable to violence. And, and those we are perhaps light as a way of knowing how we can be able to, to get rid of some of those behaviors. It's, it's a continued challenge for us, but it's something that we're taking on. And, and for us, we decided to start off um, within the schools. Um, there, are, there are a number of organizations that, that do speak to or say that they're implementing prevention programs, but just as what I said before is that the, the types of interventions that are taking place tend to be quite small, um, are not evaluated, so we're not very sure that they really did lead to prevention. So the challenge con it remains for us um, as a sector to, to put much more rigor behind um, with prevention programs. Thank you, and back to you, Lynette. Thank you very, very much. I think we've had a really engaging and rich conversation this afternoon. But I am aware that we had booked one hour of your time. I would like to thank our two presenters for the time they have put into preparing these presentations, for being available to share with us. We'd also like to thank Angelita for all her work behind the scenes in organizing this and making sure that it happens. The whole webinar has been recorded. It will be available on the REIT website. And the two presentations will also be available there for download. I think give us a few days just to get that up, but it will be there. I'd like to really thank our presenters for all, uh, not our presenters, our audience for being so engaged and so involved. We'd really, we've really appreciated all the questions and it has made it really, really exciting to be part of. Now the challenge is for all of us. Where do we go to from here? What kind of programs do we work on? What kind of policies do we push for? But there is enough hope in these presentations to give us direction. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you also to Repsi, whom I'm representing, who has been behind this as well. Bye-bye. <laughs>